It's, it's funny to me because microaggressions are the things that we often choose to ignore because we experience them so frequently. Because they happen so often, you, you kind of have to let them roll off or else they pile up and pile up and, and then you can't carry them anymore. I identify as mixed, um, which is frustrating sometimes because you're not allowed always to check more than one box. Racism in general is just it is direct and indirect acts against a person of color um, by someone in power over them. So today we don't see like signs or whatever that say whites only or anything like that, but it's coded. And so that's what I would consider like microaggressions to be is that coded language. I just don't want to lose sight of what makes up the microaggressions, right? So it is, um, you know, implicit biases around race or ethnicity or, or gender or gender expression or class or size, right, or, you know, disability, that those are the pieces that we, we've been fighting and we have always been fighting against. And it kind of led me into the path of historical trauma. And um, what is it about um, my people that we are a certain way? You know, like things happen in our communities and we just don't talk about them. Feel, um, again, different. Um, other and definitely not of the mainstream. So as a Palestinian and as a Muslim, I feel like up, up until 9-11, um, it was almost like this kind of dirty little secret. Not a lot of my friends knew that I was Palestinian background and they wouldn't have really understood or known what that is. I didn't speak English. I could understand English a little bit, but I didn't speak that well. And I think one thing that's like very, very like etched into my mind was like how people perceived continent of Africa very differently. I think what happens is that we assign a value judgment. I, I tell people all the time, I want you to see who I am. I don't want you to pretend that you can't see that I'm a female. I'm proud of being a woman, right? I don't want you to pretend that you can't see that I'm Latina, right? I'm very proud of my background and my heritage. I don't want you to pretend that I'm not a queer woman. I hear people say, well, I don't, I don't even see you as that. I just see you as Sadie. Well, I see myself as that. I'm proud of my partner, right? I'm proud of our household, of our family, and, and the community that we belong to. I want you to see all those things. I got over that after a while, trying to prove myself to people and try to show and demonstrate. It probably took a good 20 years for me to change my mindset. But by my mid-30s, I was like, I'm, I'm just who I am. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's almost like, okay, not only do you have to endure all that, but it's, you know, like they were telling you, you have to um, explain things nicely. It's also then your job to fix other people. Mm -hmm. It's your job to fix racism. Um, and you know, you're a human being. We're human yeah. beings. We only have the capacity for so much.
I guess my answer is a little bit of a cop out because <laughs> I really feel like, like you're right, it's really hard to envision this future when we've only known this history. Getting to the place where these aggressions aren't normal, like that that's that, that this isn't going to be what's expected, it isn't par for the course, um, it, making it so that me being treated as a human being and all that means, the, like the fairness that I'm entitled to, the um, kindness, grace, the um, benefit of the doubt that I'm entitled to, the life opportunities that I'm entitled to, that the cost of me getting those things isn't me participating in my own de degradation. It, it shouldn't have to cost me that.